Hello everyone, welcome back. In today's class, we are going to talk about brain and know about the different parts of the human brain and their functions. But before I start with my class, let me remind you that we have physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology classes for classes 8, 9 and 10 CBSC. We have physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology classes for classes 8, 9 and 10 ICSC. We have master coding with Java classes, Python programming classes and physics and chemistry classes for Cambridge IGCSC. Please feel free to join now or in the future and do spread the word so that we can have more people with us. So in today's class, we are going to, we have already seen the structure of the neuron and we have already understood what is reflex action. We have already seen what the neurons um, uh, make. Now we are going to go into the structure of the nervous system itself okay so so the nervous system can be classified into three parts central nervous system peripheral nervous system and autonomic nervous system so the central nervous system which consists of the brain and the spinal cord is called the central nervous system because it is the center for all information processing all decision making, what is to be done, what uh, 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 stimulus is going to be converted into a, an impulse, all that is done by this part which is the brain and the spinal cord and they also occupy the central part of the body so they are called the central nervous system. But your brain and your spinal cord to react they will have to have information. So you have to send information to your brain and to your spinal cord that you know this is happening outside so what do you want to do? So for that and, and after the brain and the spinal cord decides what to do, they will also have to send the response to whichever part of your body the response will be shown. So for that you need some uh, you know, projection from your central nervous system to go to the peripheral parts of your body that is the outer part of your body and those are the nerves. So the nerves form the peripheral nervous system, why peripheral because nerves go to the periphery of the body. And there are two types of nerves, cranial nerves and spinal nerves, okay. Then we have the, uh, okay, and what are cranial nerves? Cranial nerves are those which are connected to the brain and spinal nerves are those which are connected to the spinal cord, alright. The autonomic nervous system is the nervous system which controls certain automatic functions of our body like like dilation of the iris like uh, you know um, secretion of certain substances like heart rate like rate of respiration etc so that is why it's called autonomic because it controls some automatic functions of our body okay and what is it made up of it is also it also consists of nerves which nerves some of the cranial nerves and some of the spinal nerves they make up the autonomic nervous system so we have 12 pairs of cranial nerve and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So some of the cranial nerves and some of the spinal nerves together make up the autonomic nervous system and that is the system that controls automatic functions of our body. Alright, so autonomic nervous system in certain books you will see that the author that has included autonomic nervous system under peripheral nervous system which is also right because autonomic nervous system ultimately consists of nerves. So nerves become a part of the peripheral nervous system only that these nerves, these specific nerves they are controlling some automatic functions of our body, right. And the nerves can be of two types sympathetic and parasympathetic. They have different kinds of neurotransmitters, they have different kinds of functions, some most of their functions are opposite. So one will increase the heart rate and the other one will decrease the heart rate. One will dilate the eye pupil, the other one will constrict the pupil. So that is there plus uh, there are certain functions which are common for them. So there are two types of nerves controlling the automatic functions of our body, sympathetic and parasympathetic. Sympathetic is response, sympathetic and parasympathetic, they, are, they have different kinds of neurotransmitters in them and they have, usually they have opposite functions. So we start with the human brain. So as you all know, this is what the human brain looks like from the top. And the human brain is located inside a bony cavity, which is known as the skull or which is also known as the cranium. The cranium or the skull is made up of 
several flat bones which have been joined together and these joints are immovable and that is what makes the cranium a complete circle. So the cranium is made up of flat bones joined by immovable joints okay and these uh, uh, you know these bones they uh, make this ca case in which keeps the brain protected. Now inside this bony case there are three membranes that cover the brain and provide them with a little more protection and that is known as meninges. What is meninges? Meninges are the tri layered membrane that covers the brain and the spinal cord to provide protection. All right. So they are pre present. Um, they, pre they provide protection and they are present over the brain and the spinal cord. Now coming to the different parts of the brain. So the entire brain can be divided into three divided into three regions. The forebrain, which is known as prosencephalon. Cephalon, encephalon means brain, and pro means first. So this is the first part of the brain, that is why forebrain. Then you have mesencephalon. Meso means middle, and encephalon means brain. So this is the middle part of the brain. And rhombencephalon. This means the last part of the brain or hind brain, hind brain. Okay, so forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain are the three parts of the brain. The forebrain can be divided into telencephalon and diencephalon. Di uh, telencephalon can be divided uh, consists of one part, which is cerebrum, and diencephalon consists of thalamus and hypothalamus. Midbrain has got certain parts, but we do not go into the details of the midbrain. Hindbrain consists of two parts, metencephalon and myelencephalon. Metencephalon consists of cerebellum and pons and myelencephalon consists of medulla oblongata. Do not panic. There are too many new names I know. But once we study, once we go through each, each and every part, you will see you automatically know the meanings and the names. So let us start with the first part, which is the forebrain. And the first part and the largest part of the forebrain is the cerebrum, cerebrum, which is also known as the telencephalon. Okay. So the cerebrum, which is also known as the telencephalon, is the largest part of the human brain. And this is how it looks like. As you can see, it is divided into several regions and all these regions have separate names. So the first part, which is usually present from here till here, this part is known as the frontal lobe. The first part is known as the frontal lobe. Then we have the next part which is present from here till here, which is known as the parietal lobe. Okay. Then we have this pink region here, which is present exactly at the back. And this part is known as the occipital lobe. And then we have this region, which is known as the temporal lobe okay so these are the four major lobes and there is another one which is present uh, at the center you can't see it from outside it is present at the center there is a lobe present at the center this is known as the limbic lobe okay so there are these five different regions of the brain cerebrum which controls different functions i'll tell you what functions they control but before we go to that See, the entire surface, if you see, there are these lines, right? And even if you see the structure of the brain, you will see that there are these uh, foldings present in the brain, right? So the entire cerebrum, this is the entire cerebrum, can be divided into the right and the left side. So we call these two sides cerebral hemispheres. And they are joined by, they are not joined by, they are joined at a fissure, a groove which is present here, right? So this divides the brain into the right and the left side. And if you see the structure of the cerebrum, you will see if you just open, if you see the, uh, you know, if you just take the two cerebral hemispheres and just open it, how will it look like? Okay, so if you just open up the brain, this is the right side, this is the left side of the brain. And uh, as you can see, these are known as the cerebral hemispheres 
these are known as the cerebral hemisphere this is the right side this is the left side and if you look at the inside you will see that the outside of the cerebral hemisphere and the inside of the middle of the cere cerebral hemisphere they have different colors so the outside is gray in color why is it gray in color because it contains neurons without myelin sheath we call this region gray matter you see a cell usually cluster usually appears grayish in color but neurons if they contain myelin sheath myelin sheath is fat so if myelin sheath is present the neuron will appear whitish in color but this region is called gray matter because they are made up of non myelinated meaning neuron containing no myelin sheath they are made up of non myelinated neurons so that is why the outside appears gray but the inside appears white so the inside is made up of white matter why does it appear white just now i told you because it may it consists of neurons which have myelin sheath in them so myelinated neuron okay all right now these two the right and the left side of your um, cerebrum they need to be connected because you know although you have the right and the left side of your cerebrum if your entire brain does not work in co coordination the right and the left sides of your body will not work right so the right side of the brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body and if these two hemispheres they work as per their own wish they do not coordinate between each other then what will happen then what we will see is that the two hemispheres are doing whatever they want your right side is wanting to go to the right your left side is wanting to go to the left and you are stuck in between right so you need both these hemispheres to work together so that your entire body works in coordination and for that there is a band of neurons that keep the two hemispheres connected and whatever information the right hemisphere has the left gets it the left has the right gets it so this band of fiber ensures that the two hemispheres remain connected we call this the corpus callosum the corpus callosum which is uh keeping the right and the left cerebral hemispheres connected now if you see the surface the cortex of the uh, uh cerebrum you will see that there are certain folds so there are some folds which are deep there are some folds which are shallow and then there are regions in between two folds so those regions which are very deep folds they are known as fissures okay the shallow grooves the the shallow uh, grooves are known as sulcus pleural sulci s u l c i and the region in between two sulci or two fissures is known as gyrus pleural gyri g y r i right so the entire brain has all these folds and fissures and sulci and gyri why because when you know we evolve from fish amphibia reptilia and then we evolve right so if you if you imagine the skull of uh, fish if you imagine the skull of reptilia if you imagine the skull of amphibia they are mostly flat and the brain is also elongated the cerebrum is not round the cerebrum is elongated right but as we became mammals our skull became round and this elongated brain had to be you know had to be compressed and fit into the cranium as a result of which when you compress it you compress it and put it inside a round structure the volume of the brain is increased but the cranium the size of the skull is smaller so you are basically compacting it and the moment you fold it the entire brain develops these kind of folds right just imagine you have a clean paper and then i give you a small box to put the paper in so you crush the paper put it in the paper will have folds all over the same thing has happened to this brain okay so the brain therefore has the cerebrum therefore has all these sulci and gyri and these sulci and gyri they are uh, they are only proof that our brain uh, has been put into a smaller structure now the brain is not solid our brain and spinal cord they are not solid there are hollow cavities inside the brain and those are known as the ventricles of brain right so when you see the cerebrum on the right hand side you see one cavity on the left hand side you see one cavity these two cavities they come together to join at the sorry 
these two cavities they come together to join at the center then it forms the third cavity the third cavity gives out a stalk which goes out and forms a fourth cavity and then the fourth cavity goes down into the spinal cord as a stalk so the first chamber that is formed this is one and this is two these two are known as the ventricles of brain now we have all, always heard, heard about ventricles in the heart these are the ventricles of the brain right so you have the first and the second ventricles in the right and the left cerebral cerebral hemispheres okay so these are the two cavities present on the right inside the right and the left cerebral hemispheres we call them the first and the second ventricle or we call them the lateral ventricle so these two are known as these two are known as the lateral ventricles they are present inside the cerebral hemispheres then there is a small opening through which it opens into another chamber which is the third ventricle so first second third now the third ventricle is also in the forebrain the third ventricle is also in the forebrain okay and this opening through which the first and the second ventricle opens into the third ventricle this is known as the foramen foramen meaning opening pore of one second this is known as the foramen of monroe it is known as the foramen of monroe okay so these three are present in the forebrain the next part which is this duct this is present in the midbrain the tube is present in the midbrain it is known as the aqueduct of silvius aqueduct because it's a duct which is filled with fluid the entire all the entire ventricle is filled with fluid so it's called the aqueduct of Sil silvius and we have the fourth ventricle in the hind brain so the fourth ventricle is present in the hind brain so the first two ventricles and the third ventricle they are present in the forebrain the aqueduct of silvius is present in the midbrain and the last ventricle which is the fourth chamber fourth ventricle it is present in the hind brain okay now what does this ventricle contain inside the ventricle there is a fluid which is just like tissue fluid but it is slightly different and this fluid inside the ventricle is known as the cerebrospinal fluid so the fluid inside is known as the cerebrospinal fluid cerebro because it is present inside the brain and spinal because it is also present inside the spinal cord so this fluid is called the cerebrospinal fluid it brings nutrients it takes away waste it being brings gases that it has uh, defense like antibodies so this basically has the function like similar to blood plus it also acts as a shock absorber so since you have cerebrospinal fluid inside the brain if there is some kind of a jerk the fluid inside will change its shape and will adjust the shock your brain will not be damaged all right so this acts as a shock absorber right so this is the part of the cerebrum and as i was talking about these are the sulci and gyri present as you can see this is the shallow groove which is known as the sulcus and in between two sulci there is a convolution which is known as the gyrus and then here you can see this is the fissure this is called the media this is called the median fissure which is the you know deep groove that separates the la the right and the left cerebral hemispheres and as i was saying this is the scan of cerebrum as you can see the outside is made up of gray matter and the inside is whitish in color it is made up of white matter uh, this is a scan mri scan of uh, radio uh, uh, um, yeah it is a radiopedia so basically mri scan of uh, the um, cerebrum so you can see the gray and the white matters here okay so that was cerebrum so the first part that is telencephalon or the cerebrum which is the largest part of the brain we have talked about that now very quickly let us understand what are the functions of the different lobes of the cerebrum that we saw so the frontal lobe is the is the center for all kinds of higher order thing higher order activities of your brain like problem solving emotional traits reasoning speaking voluntary and motor activities it is also a center for learning memory intelligence judgment ambition etc 
IQ basically all the kinds of higher order thinking that you do it is this part so memory that is why when we think we do something like this as if you are trying to poke the frontal lobe that you know think and tell me okay then you have the parietal lobe the parietal lobe is responsible for I uh, knowing right versus left which is your right side which is your left side sensations reading body orientation it is also for motor actions motor activities like just moving your hands legs etc voluntary activities the occipital lobe is mainly for vision that is to see and for color perception that is to identify the color that you are seeing and you know that our eye forms eyes form an inverted image of an object so this is the part of the brain which makes the image straight and then you can understand okay this is straight and it's not inverted in front of me then we have the brain stem which is this part which is responsible for sorry we have the cerebellum we'll come to the cerebellum later so yeah oh yeah we have the temporal lobe which is responsible for understanding language behavior memory hearing etc so this is the part main part which is mainly responsible for hearing but apart from that when you hear you do not only hear you understand the language you understand like if i am speaking to you you will be able, in chinese you'll be able to probably un uh, hear me but you'll not be able to understand me so there are different centers for hearing and understanding in the temporal lobe also all right so these are the functions of the different part of the cerebrum we come to the next part so if you remember the classification the first part was cerebrum the second part is diencephalon which consists of thalamus and hypothalamus so let's see where the thalamus and the hypothalamus are present coming back to the same diagram so if you see the third ventricle this is the third ventricle near this third ventricle or on the two sides of the third ventricle there are two masses of gray matter and at the center there is one mass of gray matter so these two masses of gray matter present on the two sides of the third ventricle they are known as thalamus and this one which is present at the center single it is known as the hypothalamus thalamus is above hypothalamus is below right so if this is the third if this is the third ventricle the third ventricle goes like this sideways so on the two sides you have the thalamus and at the lower part you have the hypothalamus okay so let's see what the thalamus and the hypothalamus uh, what do they do and what are their functions so if this is as i said if this is the cerebrum then you see these are the thalamus right and the left thalamus and below the thalamus this part is the hypothalamus okay so what do they do the thalamus is responsible for coordination let's say you have gone into a movie hall a multiplex and there are five screens so you have a ticket when you go in somebody checks your ticket and says okay you go to hall number 1 somebody else says okay you go to hall number 2 so where you will go for the movie is written in your ticket so let's say an information a stimulus is coming from the eyes and it has to go to the occipital part of the uh, brain right so when the information is coming from the eye the thalamus is the relay center the thalamus directs the information to the right center okay maybe you will this information has to go to the memory center and to the hearing center and to the emotional center so all these decisions are taken by the thalamus and the thalamus is therefore known as the relay center it relays and sends information to different parts of the forebrain so it is basically the entry point of the cerebrum whichever part of the cerebrum you want to go to this is the entry point you have to cross it and then go right uh the um it also it also regulates consciousness sleep and alertness the hypothalamus on the other hand is very very important because it controls the pituitary gland which means it controls our entire hormone secreting system which we call the endocrine system so our entire endocrine system is controlled by the hypothalamus yeah the hypothalamus and apart from that so they help it helps in secretion of hormones apart from that it also controls thirst hunger meaning when you are eating or when you are drinking there's a moment when you feel okay i have eaten enough i don't want to eat any more i am full this feeling comes from your hypothalamus or when you are drinking water you feel that no i am fine i am hydrated i do not need to drink any more water that comes from the hypothalamus so it is the control center of your hunger your thirst 
it also controls body temperature regulates body temperature okay uh, it is also responsible for controlling emotions and controlling sexual behavior okay these are the apart from controlling the endocrine system these are the other functions of the hypothalamus so the thalamus and the hypothalamus both are masses of gray matter that is they are made up of non myelinated neurons they do not have myelin sheath in the neurons and you see their location they are present at the base of the brain thalamus there are two and hypothalamus there is one and these are their functions so that was about forebrain so that was all about the forebrain we have learned about the cerebrum thalamus and hypothalamus now coming to the midbrain so if we see the midbrain the midbrain is oh uh, before that yeah the midbrain is only this small part which is connecting the forebrain which is the pink region to the hindbrain which is this blue region so we can say that the midbrain is a small stalk that connects the forebrain to the hindbrain now does it have different parts yes it does but we do not go into the details of that in this class um, we go to the details of that in class 12 um, <coughs> sorry not 12 11 <coughs> if you take up biology then so this midbrain is responsible for uh, co uh, connecting the forebrain to the hindbrain so if the hindbrain has to send any information to the forebrain or the forebrain has to send any information to the hindbrain it has to pass through the midbrain so it is basically a passage between the two right we come to the last part of the brain which is the cerebellum that is the part of the hindbrain so if you see the hindbrain if you see the hindbrain the hindbrain has three parts cerebellum pons and medulla oblongata so let us see what are what these parts are so if you see this structure since it's uh, clear here so the hindbrain this part is known as the cerebellum one second this part is known as the cerebellum okay this part is known as pons and this part is known as medulla oblongata okay now the pons and the medulla oblongata they look like a stem the end of the brain so that is why they together are also known as brain stem okay so this is the cerebellum then you have in front of the cerebellum you have a white region which is known as the pons and just below the pons there is a conical region which is also white which is known as the medulla oblongata so let us start with the cerebellum first so if you look at the cerebellum the cerebellum is this region which is present just below the occipital lobe of the cerebrum it looks like a small bun that women make so this is the region which is which is known as the cerebellum if i go into the details of the cerebellum you will see that the cerebellum is also made up of a right hemisphere and the left hemisphere so it is also spherical and it also has a right side and a left side so the it has the right cerebral hemisphere and the right sorry it, it is known as the right cerebellar hemisphere and the left cerebellar hemispheres right and it has very many similarities with the cerebrum so in the cerebrum you see salsi fischer gyri here also you see salsi fischer gyri okay in cerebrum cerebrum you see there's a right and left lobe here also there is a right and left lobe in cerebrum you see the right and the left lobe remain connected here also the right and the left lobe remain connected by a middle lobe which is known as the vermis the vermis is the central lobe this part which keeps the right and the left lobes connected so that they work in coordination okay and another very important thing just like the cerebrum the cerebellum also has the outer layer of gray matter and inner layer of white matter so the cortex is made up of gray matter and the medulla that is the central part is made up of white matter okay now what is the function of the cerebellum the cerebellum is responsible for three things one posture two balance and three neuromuscular coordination so there are three functions of the brain uh, of the cerebellum posture that is when you are standing you are sitting what is your posture how are you standing you know some people stand like this some people stand like this so that posture is controlled two balance when you are walking when you are sitting there is your body or when you are standing your body balance has to be maintained so balance and last but not the least neuromuscular coordination what does that mean let's say my brain wants me to pick up this pen and write so for that 
my hand will have to move in a certain manner so that I pick it up and then my hand has to move in a certain manner so that I can write. Okay. My brain, if it cannot control my muscles, let's say my brain wants my muscle to pick up the pen, but I actually end up, you know, searching for the pen somewhere else, extending my, my hand somewhere else and looking for it. So what my brain wants me to do, my muscles are not being able to do it. That is when we say that the brain, that is the neurons and the muscles are not coordinated. So when you can do, your muscles can do exactly what your brain wants you to, you say that is neuromuscular coordination taking place, right? So neuromuscular coordination, uh, uh, this is another function of the cerebell cerebellum and people who get drunk and they cannot walk straight for them. There, the cerebellum is affected as a result of which you are thinking that you are walking straight. You are thinking that I will put my foot forward and it will land exactly where I want it to. But you do, it does not. And then you cannot control your balance. You fall. Okay. So this is known as the cerebellum. So just remember what are the similarities between cerebellum and cerebrum. Both of them have right and left hemisphere, hemispheres. Both are connected by the central region. Here it is vermis. There it is corpus callosum. Both have sulci, gyri, etc. Uh, and uh, both have grey matter outside, white matter inside. Okay. Now the situation changes. So the next region, which is the pons and the medulla oblongata. In them, we see that the position of the grey matter and the white matter becomes opposite. So for pons and medulla oblongata, the outside is white matter and the inside is grey matter. So white matter is present outside, grey matter is present inside and for the for in case of spinal cord also it is the same. Even for spinal cord white matter is present outside and grey matter is present inside. So they basically continue as spinal cord and they show this particular action, they, they, they show this particular arrangement. Okay. So what is the function of the pons and the medulla oblongata? First of all, where is the pons present? The pons is present just in front of the cerebrum. It's a white region. We say it's a white eminence. Eminence meaning a prominent region which is present just in front of the cerebrum, sorry cerebellum and just below it, this is con this conical region is known as the medulla oblongata. All right. So this, these two, they are extremely important because they control two very, very vital uh, activities of our body and those are vital reflexes and what are the vital reflexes? One, heartbeat and two, respiration. So heartbeat and respiration are two very important functions controlled by the pons and the medulla oblongata. And therefore, just in case if a person um, gets hit at the pons or the medulla oblongata and it is damaged, there will be immediate death. There cannot be any recovery, right? Apart from this, it also controls salivation. It controls vomiting and other reflex activities, right? So these two together, the pons and the medulla oblongata together, they are known as the brain stem. They are known as what? The brain stem as if this is where the brain is starting from and then you have the brain and this continues as the spinal cord, right? So, so if you look at the function of the brain stem, the brain stem is responsible for breathing. It controls body temperature, digestion, alertness, swallowing. It also controls, as I said, heartbeat, respiration, etc. Okay. So these are the functions of the brain and these are the different parts of the brain. These are the different parts of the brain that we have already studied. Let's move on to spinal cord. But before I move on to spinal cord, please let me know if this much is clear. So about spinal cord, we are not going to learn too much. What we are going to, what do we know about spinal cord? Spinal cord starts from the base of the brain. Okay. So if you see our skull, if you see the human skull, the base of the human skull has an opening. This opening is known as the foramen, meaning opening, magnum, meaning large, foramen magnum. So the brain, which is present here, here and the pons, it basically comes down as the spinal cord through this brain and goes into the vertebral column. So this is the vertebral column. It goes inside the vertebral column and comes out through the foramen magnum and continues, right? 
So it starts on the base of the brain and continues till the last vertebrae in case of infants. But as we grow, you know, we know that our nerve cells do not divide. So the length of the spinal cord remains almost the same. It elongates a little bit, but it does not elongate too much. So when we are infants, our spinal cord reaches till the end of our vertebral column. But as we grow now, our spinal cord ends somewhere here. Right? So if you see the spinal cord, if you see the spinal cord, the spinal cord can be divided into five regions. The first region which is known as the cervical region, it is present in the neck. It is known as the cervical region, it is present in the neck. Then we have the thoracic region which is present in the upper part, right, just in the chest cavity. Then we have the lumbar region which is present in the lower back. Then we have the sacral region which is the hip and finally we have the coccygeal region which is the tailbone. Okay, so when we are infants, when we are being born, our sp spinal cord extends almost till the coccygeal region. But by the time we are, we are adults, our spinal cord extends till here, till the, till the lumbar region and the rest has all the nerves coming out of the spinal cord. Right, And if you see the spinal cord, it is not a cylinder, it is dorsiventrally flattened. What is the meaning of dorsiventrally flattened? If you hold it from the back and from the front and just press it a little bit, then that is known as dorsi meaning back, ventral meaning front, dorsiventrally slightly flattened. Right. So if you cut through the spinal cord, if you just cut through the spinal cord and look at its cross section, it will appear like this. If you see the structure, you see it is a it is very clear that this spinal cord has been flattened from the back and from the front. So it has a kind of a squarish structure rather than a cylindrical structure, right? So what are the different parts? If you see, the entire spinal cord can be divided into the right side and the left side by a sulcus here and a deep groove here, okay? So it can be divided into the right and the left side. and this is the dorsal side, this is the ventral side. Dorsal meaning the part which is, which is facing your back and ventral meaning the part of the spinal cord which is facing your front. Okay. Now, in the spinal cord, inside, this is exactly the arrangement of grey matter and white matter is exactly the opposite as brain. So, the inside has grey matter and the outside has white matter which is exactly opposite till the cere cerebellum. Pons and medulla oblongata again has this arrangement. Inside uh, uh, grey matter, outside white matter. And at the center, there is a small cavity which is known as the central canal. This central canal is a cavity through which again that fluid flows. Which fluid which is present inside the ventricle of the brain. That is cerebrospinal fluid. So the cerebrospinal fluid flows through this center, central canal. Now, as you can see, the information from the receptor is coming through the ventral root. So, the sorry, through the dorsal root. So, the dorsal part of your spinal cord is the part through which information comes in. So, the dorsal part is the sensory root. Okay. And the ventral part information goes out through the ventral part. So, the ventral part is the motor root. That is information goes out. So, information comes in from the dorsal root. Information goes out from the ventral root. All right. So these are the different pa different parts of the spinal cord. So with that we come to the end of the. Um, so with that we come to the end of the central nervous system. We will continue with this chapter in our next class. But before I end with my class, let me remind you that we have physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology classes for classes eight, nine, and ten CBSC. We have physics, chemistry, mathematics, and biology classes for classes eight, nine, and ten ICSC. We have master coding with Java classes, Python programming classes and physics and chemistry classes for Cambridge IGCSC. Please feel free to join now or in the future and do spread the word so that we can have more people with us. Thank you very much uh, uh, for being with me today. I'll see you in my next class. Till then, take care.